like to ask any of the patients this evening to uh, consider the wonderful mystery you've got about which Paul was speaking. And we had, we were looking together the Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36, when I went out this afternoon to learn of that grand occasion when God gave that mighty Bible study on the status of Jesus Christ, his personal position and his relationship to all the created beings, namely the angels and the inhabitants of various worlds back at that time. Page 36 in the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. Now this sermon, and I call it a sermon because it was certainly a presentation by God the Father on a spiritual issue, was designed to set forth the true position of, of his son and to relate his sustain to all created beings. Now, as I said this afternoon, it seems that a simple task for God to do this, and He should easily have convinced the angels and the unfallen beings, uh, and the fallen beings, as the real truth in regard to this matter. But uh, when we consider that uh, He failed to convince Lucifer and his followers, although they haven't fully rebelled yet, but He still failed to convince them. Is the dangerous nature, the bewitching nature of error, which when, when a Christian mind declares that mind makes it impossible for a person to see the truth, even though God himself should spell it out. And in my life experience, of course, I found, found it quite amazing to see how, in the case of Protestant people, how they come to the Sabbath, the, uh, the truth of the God, the Lord of God, perfection, and so forth. And even as the years have gone by, they only made sure that the Christian folk who can't any longer see the truth of God given it to us. We should be very concerned about the danger of being bewitched by the false sophistries who have their power on the mind. And uh, Lucifer was was impressed for the moment. He bowed with the other angels, and but in his heart there was a strange, fierce conflict. And in the end, pride and selfishness reigned supreme, and he lost his place up in heaven, heaven, in heaven above. Now, the issue in the great controversy from the very beginning then was what? The mystery of God, right? Now it's a mystery. No question about that. Um, what else is up? Anyway. What? What do you need? Well, it seems to disappear, but don't worry about it. I'll do it out. Now let me say again then that the great controversy began over the issue of the mystery of God, which involved the position of God, position of Jesus Christ and the position of all the fallen, or the unborn beings then, the fallen beings now. now. If the great converse began over that issue, then what issue must be settled before the converse can be ended? Right, the mystery of God, which also involves the character of God. Because in his attempt to overthrow the mystery of God, Satan most certainly maligned God's character. Now, the maligning of God's character, of course, produced rebellion. And the controversy cannot be finished until the rebellion has been properly and successfully dealt with by the true revelation of God's character. And in this in this paragraph on page 36 of the book Patriarchs and Prophets, how is Christ uh, presented again and again and again, over and again, as the Son of God and as the only begotten Son of God? I think about four or five times he's referred to in this fashion, and God is called the Father in this paragraph as well, which clearly shows that Jesus Christ became the only begotten of God long before Bethlehem. In fact, long before this world was even created, and created, created because this time the world was not even yet brought into existence. Now, despite the fact that the loyal angels, two thirds of them, uh, uh, continued to support God in his cause and did not come to that rebellion, they still had some very serious question marks in their mind, which right up to Calvary's cross, as we learn, of course, in the seven angel presentation. But let's look at an, an incident before that time which shows that they were still not truly aware of God's relationship to sinners and, re and rebels. Page 36 to 37 of the book, Desire of Ages. Now, on page 36, we're told that sin had reached its height, and that uh, man can become totally depraved by the power of evil, and that the angels of the on were dismayed and horrified by the power of evil and its effect upon the human organism. And that we 
Burnsborough plays the seven now and start with the words with intense interest and what do you please? With intense interest? With intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing to himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness. Which included all the angels as well, was that Jehovah would rise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth, just destroy every one of them. Does this mean that they expect God to do this personally, or that he abandoned mankind to their fate, to its fate? Whichever way, of course, was amount to the same thing in the end, wouldn't it? Now, for them to expect that is a revelation to us that they did not fully understand God's way of doing things even yet, after 4,000 4, years of sin. Now mind you, we need to be uh, fair to the angels in four worlds, of course, because they, from their viewpoint of spotless purity, were able to recognize the sheer enormity of sin, its real character, its real hateful, uh, hatefulness, its, its, uh, its, its power to be disgusting, and so on. And they also understood God's personal hatred of sin as well, so they felt much more strongly about this than we would who have been used to sin by being around us all the time. And in view of the fact that they looked upon God's own abhorrence of the evil, that well, he could not help himself but to rise up and wipe this ugly blot away from the universe. Now, if God had done that, or was Satan had charged? The sin could not be forgiven. The man was totally lost anyway. Now, God's kingdom had to change its principles in order to accommodate those who wish to be independent and ambitious and self-exalting. God could not do. Now, if Satan had been successful in laying this charge against God, what would have happened to the entire universe? Say again. Right. He would become infected with sin and turn destroyed because the angel had lost confidence in the God of, this, of our salvation. But, was God then, as a perfectly controlled being, holding himself back to save himself from being charged by Satan or did he do this because of the outpouring of his love? Absolutely. Right? At the very crisis when Satan seemed about to triumph, the Son of God came with the embassage of divine grace. Through every age, through every hour, the love of God had been exercised toward the fallen race. Now, let's go back to the flood when God did sweep away the inhabitants of the earth, we may use that, use that expression, it's a Bible expression of course, we understand how it happened, mind you, that God simply was forced to withdraw and mankind destroyed themselves. Now the question is, why did not God send Jesus Christ then, why did he wait for almost 4,000, well about 2,500 years later? Um, at the flood he left man to perish, all the eight people, whereas at, the, at Bethlehem, he sent Jesus Christ to halt the terribly destructive downfall of mankind. Why did God wait to do what appears to be a different thing in one case from the other? Has there got to be a good reason? A very good reason indeed. Can you suggest what that reason might be? I understand. There isn't quite a year. Well, there's so much sin that was in that time period that it was almost impossible to change. Well, we believe, don't we, that uh, after the flood, sin definitely reached its height, didn't it? Right. Things could not have been worse than the flood. So you find that there's an equal situation as far as sinfulness is concerned at the flood and at the first coming of Jesus Christ. They're equal to each other, sin-wise. Physical body? Wasn't that as degenerate? Right. The effects of, while sin itself was uh, at its height back at the flood, its effects upon mankind have not yet become visible. Yes. Not yet. They're both intense to each other. They're both as intense to each other. But the effect of sin was not visible at the flood because it took over 2,000 years before sin first began to make its, make its appearance, or sickness first began to make its appearance in the lives of mankind. So the effects of sin were not visible at the time of the flood. Men could sin with apparent impunity and look as if sin was a, uh, a worthwhile project at that time. 
I know the statement right there in volume three, we're told that uh, it took almost 2,000 years before the first sickness appeared in the bodies of men after the fall of man. Throughout the flood, then mankind was still robust and healthy and vigorous, even though he was abusing himself in a, in a very uh, sinful and improper way. Now, there's more to, we come back then to the point of wisdom and love, and there's much more to the expression of God's love than, than sheer necessity, there's also wisdom. And Jesus Christ had to, had to do more in the mystery of God than simply save mankind. He had to demonstrate, in fact, even to save mankind, to demonstrate certain things, namely the character of God to the power of man, or the power of God in man to save him from sin, uh, and three had to marry the humanity as well. Now, Jesus Christ had to come to this earth when not only, and this might this point, he had, he had to wait until this earth was at its most sinful state and the effects of sin upon the folk were most manifest. Both conditions had to be fulfilled because Christ had to come to the end of this world and demonstrate that in that kind of uh, uh, connection or environment or situation that the law could be kept to perfection, right? I can't hear him way over there. Could you come to the I'll just talk louder. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay, so the effects of sin at the time of the flood were not uh, evident for the fact there was a long, term, long period of time for it to take place, whereas the time of Jesus the effects of sin from, that accumulated from that time period were, were evident to the people. They could actually see their actions, what, what had come to be, whereas the time of the first sin, they could not see what were the, the long-term effects of sin. No, that's correct. That is quite correct. When when Christ appeared the first time, sickness was absolutely rampant in, in the country with leprosy and uh, palsy and paralysis and lameness and blindness and early deaths and so forth. The whole world, world was so sick that it could it faced uh, destruction or self-annihilation. As I said before, in order to fulfill his divine mission, which is more than just to save mankind, Christ must wait until sin had reached his height and the effects of sin were totally manifest. And that time came, of course, when he came to this earth at, 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 at uh, 4,000 years after the fall of man. The flood was 1656 years after the fall, but Christ came just about 4,000 years after the fall, about uh, 2,000 years later. Now, um, let's pick up my thought again here, right? Uh, so, when the situation arose, the eight, uh, Christ could not come to the time of the flood. That's what I thought of you. The question was why did Christ not come to the time of the flood when it was later? Because the conditions we met were not fulfilled until a later point of time. Now, if Christ had not come when he did it bet for him, what again would have happened to the world? It would have self-destructed. And this time, apparently, totally, there would be no survivors whatsoever, in which case, of course, the plan of salvation could not be carried out. So then, um, the angels, apparently not fully understanding that principle, look for God to repeat that... Um, in Christ's day, what he done back at the flood. In other words, stand back and let the end time will perish and self-destruct completely. And apparently not fully realize, of course, the implications of that thereafter. So when Paul said in Ephesians, the third chapter, that the mystery had not been understood in the past as it then was, was he speaking the truth? He certainly was. Not even the angels truly understood and completely saw the full implications of the mystery of God in the plan of salvation. Now, coming a little further in this, in this same principle, let's turn to Romans 7, 1 to 4 from that. It's a very old familiar scripture to us, of course. And uh, this is the marriage, um, not a parable, but uh, illustration used by the Apostle Paul in respect to our being married to Jesus Christ. Now, our salvation depends upon this marriage because I'll just review the seed petal very quickly just for the moment to bring us all together on this point. In the Garden of Eden, a righteous immortal Adam, if he had children, would have produced righteous immortal children. Right? If he'd done that. But, but uh, before he and Eve came to the place that we were going to have a family, they sinned. 
and they lost their righteousness and their immortality, and then they had sinfulness or unrighteousness and mortality. So what then land could they impart to their offspring? What they themselves had, which was unrighteousness and mortality. And in other words, life has gone death to its place. Now, it is therefore not enough to forgive a fallen human being. He must also have the gift of life to replace the lost life that he had before. After all said and done, a forgiven dead man is no better off than an unforgiven dead man. Right? So there's been cases, of course, where folk have been unjustly accused of a crime they never committed, and be sentenced to death and executed for that crime, buried in their graves, losing life and home and property and wives and children and so forth. And 10, 15, 20 years later, some evidence comes to the surface which shows that some other person did the crime and the buried, executed man is quite innocent. In which case, of course, they bring nobly and in a pardon. <laughs> a little late, of course, but then what they do it. What problem is that to him? <laughs> None whatsoever. It, uh, it, may, it may appease or it may perhaps give satisfaction to the relatives of the deceased, but uh, not to him himself. So if God then should have done no more than to give us forgiveness for our sin, we'd all be forgiven dead men and women, and how much better off would we be? Not at all. So therefore, in order to, re to, to give us the capacity to go back to heaven, God must give us the gift of life. But the point is this, that in this world, the gift of life can only come by the implantation of seed. Every single organism which exists in the world today comes into existence in that fashion. We all did. Trees, grass, all these things do. Animals, birds, and whatnot, reptiles, they all come from the seed. The seed produced by the male and the female combination make up the one complete seed from the two. This means then that we have to we have to be provided with a seed producer or a seed bearer in whom is immortality and righteousness. Because only that kind of person can impart immortality and righteousness. And who, and who is that seed bearer? Obviously Jesus Christ. Okay? Now I think I'd like to stress the point that this was the only way which, which, which man could be saved. Because God must abide by law. He doesn't bring in his commandments. Once he established the principle that in this world, seed bearing is the only way life can be generated, or, or generated as the word is, then God must devise a means whereby mankind could be saved by receiving a seed in which were immortality and righteousness. Now, Jesus Christ is the only possible husband who can produce that kind of seed. But, before he could impart this, he must be married to humanity, therefore, therefore he must himself become incarnate. You know, it was a mystery that had to be repeated in Bethlehem, it had to be, because angels don't marry. And as an angel, Christ could not marry the human family, could he? Angels are not uh, bisexual, they're... they're uh, they're not men and women, they, just, they don't have that power to reproduce themselves, and they clear by Christ to marry between two. So therefore, as an angel, Christ could not marry humanity or, or, or reproduce himself in humanity, should be better say. <coughs> so therefore, he had to marry humanity in order to do that, and therefore the mystery of God had to be repeated, and, repeated um, in his own incarnation in Bethlehem. And that's why Christ came down as a God to enter into the body of a human being, with both God and man in the one person, creator and creature in the one person, with being at this level, we've done the eternal purpose of God with an angel previously. Now, we don't know, we have no idea how Christ was begotten in the form of an angel. We're just not told that. We don't speculate either in that field. We know better how to become a man, of course, which is our immediate concern and need. Now, having once, in, uh, now, having once become a human being, God in the flesh, whom then can Jesus Christ marry? Any person who will accept his proposal. Any person. And once he's married to that person, he can then give that person his seed, and the seed can germinate and produce righteousness and immortality in that person. So therefore the mystery of God becomes the way of our salvation, doesn't it? Without that without we're totally and hopelessly, hopelessly lost. This is why, let's go across to 1 John chapter 4 for a moment to look at the scripture here. 
1 John chapter 4. Oh, I really appreciate this scripture because it's very powerful, pre cut scripture. I just wonder why churches, of course, can't see this. Let's take verses 1 through uh, 6, I think, yes, from John chapter 4. Someone want to read it, please. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. As many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in new flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in new flesh is not of God. And this is the Spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Uh, they are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Thank you very much. Now, we lean very heavily upon the scripture in the early days of this movement when there was a big contest between us and the civil evidence church in regard to the nature of Christ. I'll just repeat some of the main points again this evening. They were warned not to believe every spirit to test the spirits were they of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God, or as the old translation says, hereby know you the Spirit of God. Here is the measuring line, the test. In other words, we find that uh, God is committed to the principle of the mystery of righteousness or godliness, or the mystery of God. Now here it is, every spirit confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. That's one side of the picture. The other side is that every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of Antichrist, and so on. Now there's more to this than just meets the eye on the surface, because obviously Satan has read this scripture. He knows this test. He desires to protect himself from this test. So how would he do that? By introducing a counterfeit by making it appear that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh in those churches which are under his power. Right? There's the Roman Catholic Church, for instance. Now, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Christ was truly God and truly man, doesn't she? That she is the Antichrist. So there's something wrong with uh, or something of a subterfuge or deceit or, or counterfeit in that in that presentation. Now this doesn't say what kind of flesh, does it? It just simply says in the flesh. And John didn't need to say what kind of flesh because other parts of the Bible say it for us. Let's go to go to Hebrews, the third chapter, for instance, and we'll find out uh, just what kind of flesh is being referred to in the scripture. Hebrews the third chapter. I think it is, it's not. Uh, second chapter. <coughs> right. I'm not used to the new Bible because I can find the best bit of my old Bible. Now let's, let's take verse 11 to 13 first of all, please. 10 to 13. Chapter 2, Hebrews. For it was fitting for him. For whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren, in the midst of the assembly I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom thou hast given me. Inasmuch then as the children... Thank you very much. Now, we're told in verse 11 that he who sanctifies or makes holy, and that is whom? That's Jesus Christ, the Saviour. The word sanctifies, of course, means to make holy or to redeem or to make righteous. And those who are being sanctified, who are they? Who believe in Jesus Christ, the saints, as the Bible calls them, are all of one. Now I appreciate some translations which say are all of one origin, a common origin. Now what is the combined origin of Jesus Christ, who was born of God, and he was born of 
fallen, sinful, mortal man. Okay? And what is the origin of a truly born again child of God? He's born of God, literally, and he's also born of fallen, sinful, mortal humanity. So they're all of one origin. Wherefore, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. <clears throat> this thought is repeated even more strongly in verse 14. 15, verse 14 and 15. Can I read it, please? Inasmuch then, yes, go ahead. Inasmuch then, as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Thank you very much. Now, in this place, there's the children of the black of flesh and blood. The children are not the father. Who is the father of the human family? Right. Uh, well, yeah, he's the creator, really, but uh, I'm thinking in terms of actual, actual uh, being begotten at this point. Adam was, right? The first Adam was the father of the human family. He was the father, not the children. And the children of Adam, of course, all that have been born of him since the, the, the uh, dawn of time. And any child of Adam, from the very first child of Adam, was a partaker of what kind of flesh and blood? Immortal, perfect and sinless, righteous, or mortal, sinful, unrighteous, unholy, and so on. So now, if the children partook of that kind of flesh and blood, he himself likewise, which means in the same way, which is by the process of being begotten, or being born, physically born, even born. So he himself likewise shared in the same or partook of the same that through that he might destroy him and have the power of death that is the devil. So then this scripture says as plainly as it could ever be written that Jesus Christ took the same flesh and blood not of the unfallen Adam but of the fallen, mortal, sinful people from Adam's time to ours. Could you ask for a clearer scripture than that? So let's suppose Christ had come down in sinless righteous, holy, immortal flesh and blood. Could that kind of flesh and blood be married to to a fallen human being? No. It would be impossible. You know, it was a mystery of God could not be carried out under those conditions. Jesus Christ to marry, marry us and be one of us, not one of the unfallen that are making the beginning. No way in the world could that be so. Now let's read verse 17, shall we? Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make the appreciation for the sins of the people. Right. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest, etc. Now, if he's made in all things like his brethren, he must have a human nature exactly like theirs, and a divine nature also exactly like theirs, or they have it exactly like his, and what should better, should better put it. So when we read in 1 John chapter 4, 1, then let's go across there for the moment again. 1 John right, chapter 4, verse 1, or verse 2 rather. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. In other words, every teaching which supports the truth about the mystery of God is of God. Whereas... Every spirit confesses that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Now what kind of flesh? Hebrews told us the same fallen mortal flesh as the children. The teaching is of God. Now there's certain variations. Satan is able to bring this thing very close to us, of course. The farthest out position is over the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, or well, the Roman Catholic Church, you'd better say. They believe that miraculously Mary was given an immaculate conception conception free from mortality, free from sin, free from unrighteousness, and therefore she could and did impart to Jesus Christ the same faultless, immortal flesh and blood. That's the worst case of all. Now, of course, Mary was translated, they believe, after she died to heaven, so she never died anyway, according to their teaching, so she certainly had immortality in their view. Now, the next position, of course, is of the modern Protestant church, including the Adventist church, and uh, they don't give to Mary in the conception, they give to, but they give it to Christ directly, directly for the same purpose, of course, 
But did she have the unformed nature of Adam before the fall? Have you heard that theory of this church? Yes. Right. Now the reformed people, some of those reformed people go one step farther, and the concerned brethren that roam the world at the present time, that is the Orthodox Adventist people, have this have this theory in which they believe that Christ came into fallen sinful flesh at Bethlehem, but he does not come into my fallen sinful flesh today, excepting as a partner to the existing presence of Satan's offspring in us. Right? They have the old and the new husband side by side in the one place because they do not believe in the eradication principle. But as we said, as we saw today earlier, the, the, I should say, first of all, as, as Wagner points out, in every new birth experience, the mystery of the incarnation is repeated. And that would mean the mystery of God is repeated. And it's true because uh, the mystery of God is repeated every point in Christ because it becomes divinity dwelling in fallen and sinful mortal humanity. Now, it's not enough to believe Christ came into sinful form and flesh in Bethlehem. That, 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 that's not enough. It's enough. It's, it's uh, a start, not enough. We must also believe that he also came into form and sinful flesh and blood today. Right? To your and my personal flesh and blood body, he comes as a resident, as an occupant, as the living presence of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Now, human logic, that terrible thing it can be sometimes, in fact, all human logic is pretty unreliable. Uh, proposes the apparently logical uh, observation that God can never dwell with sin, which of course is true. He can't. That's why we cherish sin we can't God's blessing. We must give up our cherish sin to be blessed of Him. So they say, how could the sinless presence of God abide in a mortal, sinful, fallen body? That's the question. Let's go back to the sanctuary for a moment to find the answer to this. The sanctuary building was composed of materials taken from the sin-cursed earth of that day. It was made of sin-cursed dust. The gold, the silver, the brass, the linen, everything was from the dust. In fact, if you think about it, every product we enjoy today comes from the earth, doesn't it? Take this timber and this dead, where does it come from? A tree, where did the tree come from? The earth. Take the metal in this, in this bracket up here, where did it come from? Earth. Came from the earth. Take us where did we come from? Earth. Dust of the earth. Everything comes from the earth, every last thing, all the sea, which of course is but a receptacle from the land anyhow. So that uh, every part of our sanctuary came from some sin-cursed portion of the dust of the earth, and worst of all came from the most irreligious, rebellious, wicked nation upon the face of the earth, namely Egypt. Didn't it? So there was that building. Now what difference is there between that building and our bodies? No, no, no. Then what we just did was from the sin cursed dust of the earth and mortal in the sense would pass away. So likewise our bodies are in the same condition and the horse would also pass away. Now, into that building where the sin cursed dust of the earth came through his presence, personally. God's own presence in Jesus Christ. So if Jesus Christ could dwell in that building, built by sinful human hands of, of, of form and sinful dust and, and so on, then, can, then God can dwell in that kind of building and do it quite successfully. Yes. Now, if, you do, if you do it to the building, what about in your body and then life? Can your body can become a temple for the Spirit of God? Yes. Absolutely. Right? And as I said this afternoon, of course, Sin even appears in heaven itself in the sanctuary up there, making the sanctuary unclean and required to be cleansed in due time from the uncleanness which is in it. So it's a very unrealistic and erroneous position to take that sin can that, that God cannot dwell with his own people in sinful humanity. Of course, this is the Babylonian position, mind you. As read from Daniel chapter two the other night, that uh, the wise men said, said to the king that the gods do not dwell with flesh, but our God does dwell with flesh. Excuse <coughs> me. And I'm sure that he does. It's our salvation. So the mystery of God that has been an unfolding and very beautiful and powerful truth this time has gone by. Let's go back to Ephesians, the third chapter again. My time's to be by again. Ephesians chapter 3. 
and verse 5, some other written please. Which pages Thank you very much. Now Paul here says that the mystery of God, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now can we accept then the fact that there's been a progressive unfolding of this great truth? Certainly. Paul says so, and the facts, of course, uh, they make it clear to us. Let me just repeat the thought in regard to the angels again. We saw how they had a missed expectation of God's reaction to the sin problem back in the days of Jesus Christ before Christ came. But once they came to Calvary's cross, what happened to those misconceptions? They were clarified. They then understood that how God would react, we joyfully go forth and join in his reactions. And certainly, of course, the earth was darkening before Christ's first advent because of the ignorance of the people, the rejection of the truth. Because of Pentecost, a tremendous revelation of the mystery of God was afforded to God's folk, which was their power and their strength. It was lost during the Dark Ages, of course, but we find being recovered in the end of their message. And I would suppose that today we have as, as clear a view of the straits of it as anybody has in the of the past. Now, the better we understand the mystery of God, which encompasses the divine order, divine election, the Sabbath rest principles, God's salvation, all that, that we shall be able to fit into the divine scheme of things and find our rightful place in the final unfolding of events. Now verse 6 says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ to the gospel, which will become a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effect of working his power. Now the, the reason why we find this developing, unfolding of the mystery of God is so that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and place of his promise in Christ to the gospel. Now how would the Gentiles be especially benefited by revelation of the mystery of God? Any thoughts on that? Say again. Allow them salvation. You allow them salvation, sure. Well, Gentiles were at enmity with the Jews, right? And certainly against the Christians as well. In fact, uh, when you look at Nero's behaviour against the Christian, which, ended up, which caused Paul to be beheaded along amongst others, we find that the enmity was extremely severe, even more severe against the Jews, it was severe against the Christians. And that enmity must remain until men like Nero should see, if possible, the mystery of God and have that mystery recreated in them. Now, when it should be recreated in them, what would be the change in their attitude towards the Christians? And even, okay, even towards the non-Christians, that matter too. Well, love would take the place of hate, fellowship the place of separation, love the place of the place of persecution, or tolerance the place of persecution, and so forth. So wherever the mystery of God is experienced by God's people, Christ is personally enthroned in what's in shines out, and that person becomes a transformed person into the likeness of Christ and is changed from glory to glory until the work is complete. And I certainly can recommend to us all to spend time in contemplation of and the study of the wonderful mystery of God, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'll stop at that point, time is almost gone. So if any Christian would like to ask, I'd like to have this your opportunity. Yes. Didn't the Gentiles represent to the Jews about teach them the idea that because the Gentiles were so sinful in their thinking that Christ could actually dwell in them? It was a teaching of this very principle that Christ did well in sinful human flesh. I didn't quite get the well, the Jews thought of themselves as being sinless. Right. I mean, they were, but they thought of themselves as being like that. But to have the gospel actually be presented to the Gentiles was a lesson that that sin, sinless human or sinless Christ's sinlessness could actually dwell in sinful human flesh. 
But that was, that was hard to learn, there wasn't it? They, yeah. they couldn't see that. But they, they thought they were too depraved, too unholy, too degraded to be saved. See, they had to learn the same lessons that we, you know, that we had to learn. They were taught the very same things that we are taught. Sure. Sure. Chris, they're closing in showing. Bye, baby.